Okay, another podcast on developing cricketers uh, in the series. And today in particular, I'm really excited to be sharing with you some of my thoughts and ideas around what I believe made my coaching successful over the last couple of years. Some key understandings that I feel like I figured out that has made a huge, huge difference to not only me, but also the, the cricketers that I work with. Um, and I suppose the easiest way to get into this conversation is to maybe just make a couple of um, definitions at the start of this conversation. Um, so cricket is seen as this real technical game, yeah? <clears throat> at times described as one of the most technical sports in the world. I'm not sure if that's entirely true, because I've come to learn that all sports, even the ones that look very mundane, like when you really get into them, or the ones that don't look technically as complex, when you really, really get into them, there's always some technical stuff that we don't initially consider if you don't know the sport. Take a sport like rugby. I think it's just passing a ball. But passing a ball isn't, and kicking a ball, it's not really that, right? There's so much more to it. And so I think every sport has a technical element to it um, that sets it apart from other sports that challenges athletes to develop their skills in certain ways. And so a couple of definitions, right? So the first one is how do I define technique? So technique to me is the technicalities. It is the itty bitty little pieces of information that when you look at an athlete, you can say, yeah, technically they are doing something. So it could be the angle of their foot. It could be how they move. It could be how, from a cricket point of view, how that bat swings and how we get it to swing, where their elbow is, where their hands are, where their grip is. Uh, from a bowling point of view, where they land, the angle that they land at, the pace at which they land. And so technicalness is something that can be measured it's something where you can take a still photo of somebody and sort of see where they're at. Is their head upright? And so it, it tends to be these little, 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 tiny little pieces of information that um, make up, I suppose, at the end of the day, what we would call a shot or a bowling action. Um, and there's so much of it, right? There's so much technical stuff out there. A lot of people think it's the holy grail. I don't. Like we learned in the previous podcast, <clears throat> that I think we've got to have a fundamental base, right? A fundamental sort of core principle idea. And then that must inform the technique. But that's in the previous conversation. So for today, I just want to make that uh, this distinction clear, right? So there's the technical side of the game, and then there's the skill based side of the game, or what I speak of when I speak of skills is the ability to. So the ability to hit the ball on the ground through the covers, the ability to bowl in a way swinger. Now, if you go look at cricketers all around the world, so many of them aren't, so many of the world-class players aren't always technically correct. Sure, some have been. Jock Cullis, Sachin Tendulkar, but I think the more we go and the deeper we go and the further we go with this game and how it's busy evolving more and more into the T20 and the T10 age where it's more about hitting than it is just about playing a correct shot, the more we'll find that the pureness of technique, which is beautiful to watch, will potentially become distilled over time it'll potentially become warped a little bit over time. And sure, there's the Virat Kohli's of the world with still very, very good technique if you go by the coaching manual. Um, but even him have some has some technical deficiencies playing away from his body, things like that, that gets him into trouble. But even even having said that, that you know, the, the, the purest can still play T20 cricket. They can still find a way. They can still strike at high at high strike rates. Still win World Cups, right? Even though the world is saying they're not batting quick enough. Um, and so I think there's a space for both, right? 
Personally, I learned more to skill development at a younger age rather than technical development. Okay, and so the primary idea for this for me is um, built around this sort of understanding I have, right? And so I'm going to use a metaphor to maybe just explain this. The metaphor goes as follows. If you imagine a sculptor, right? Some person who works, uh, who sculpts things out of rock, okay? Um, and imagine he's got a giant piece of rock in front of him or her. And they are going to carve out of this piece of rock a masterpiece. They're going to carve a person on a horse to celebrate some war that was fought somewhere. So they've got a person on a horse and they've got a, a flag in the one hand and a gun over the shoulder and the horse is standing on two legs, right? How does that, how does the person go about that? So they're going to craft a masterpiece. Do they start with chiseling the eye of the horse and the detail of the eyelashes? I don't think that's how they started. I think they go, okay, here's this giant piece of rock. Let's get it roughly into the shape of what I'm looking for. And so they'll take off the big pieces first, right? Um, and then once they've taken off the big pieces and they've got a rough shape, then they'll start taking off smaller pieces, right? And smaller pieces and smaller pieces and smaller pieces. And eventually they get down to chiseling the eyelashes of the horse. The greatest level of detail. Um, and so there's a, there's a saying that says mastery is in the detail. Now, I think if we think of young cricketers, right? So let's say we start right at the beginning. You're coaching five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-olds who's just beginning in the game. And maybe to keep this conversation relevant, let's just work with a specific shot, right? Uh, let's take a, everybody's favorite cricket shot, a cover drive. And let's just say we're going to coach somebody at cover drive at the age of five or six. I don't go for the detail. I don't, I don't buy into that. Like these tiny little details uh, that we've got to teach the cricketer, like keep your foot like this, hold your bat like that. Um, you know, I think we give them a very rough understanding of what a stance is. We give them a very basic understanding of uh, how to swing their cricket bat. And I think we give them a very basic understanding of um, how they got to move. And then we let them play. Then we let them move and play and move and play. And we give them large pieces of information. Just an example, if I coach the, a five or six-year-old, I will not tell them, get your wrist like this and hold your bat at this angle. And none of those technical details. More just I want the bat to swing from one shoulder to the other shoulder, as an example, right? And so that just creates the image and it's very vague language. And then I see how do they swing it from one shoulder to the other shoulder? And normally that creates, a, you know, like some sort of emotion there that they, that they're getting their bat up onto their shoulder and they're swinging it onto the other shoulder. And initially it might be straight and it might be horrible and they might be swinging everything to the leg side and it might be a little bit all over the show. That's okay. At that age, that's okay. Um, and then as we go, more and more details will be added in. So maybe they lose their balance, so they're, or they're not standing still nicely, right? And so we'll teach them some technical thing, maybe a positioning of their feet to get them to stand still. And normally, I'll just say stand still first. That'll be, let's see if you can keep your feet still through the shot. Again, just a vague, just a vague instruction, and then see what they do with that information. Perhaps they start getting their feet into better positions to keep balance by themselves. Perhaps they don't. And when they don't, that's when I'll give the technical information. So the idea is not to just give the technical information up front and say, right, we're going to do the cover drive. For the cover drive, you've got to have your feet like this, bend your knee like that, keep your back leg straight, keep your hips silent, turn your front shoulder to the ball, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and be like a regurgitating I know, I know the technicalities of the game. I'm just going to give this to you. I'd rather give like big, vague pieces of information to give a basic understanding of what it is that we're looking to do. Let them do it. Let them have fun. And then as we go, we chip away, just like the master sculptor will chip away at the rock. 
you know, if you listen to international cricketers sometimes talk about the adjustments they make to their game, you'll often hear them say, oh, I just turned my back foot a little bit. Um, you know, I, I just changed my hands a fraction, yeah, and then boom, it allows me to do this. And so I think sometimes we think of that and then we think, well, 11-year-olds must think like that too. Where 11-year-olds, they maybe have medium-sized pieces of information. You know, they may be past the real rough and rugged big pieces being cut off and we can start sort of dripping through smaller bits of information to them. Okay. Now, now here's why this is important from a cricketer's experience point of view is that I believe in the strategy of creating confidence at each level. So if you take a skill like the cover drive, right, where a cricketer can hit a ball that comes at a high speed where they, they wait beautifully for it. They've got a step towards the ball. They've got a beautiful swing of their bat. They can hold their shape. They can be balanced. They can do all the good things that we want to see. If you think of how the cricketer gets there, right? So I like this idea of keeping it like super simple when they're young and giving them a positive experience with that. Um, and, and sort of letting letting that experience grow on them. I'll, I'll give a simple example. I'm coaching somebody at this point in time and coaching a whole bunch of people actually, but coaching, coaching somebody at this point in time that uh, it, it's taken three sessions for them to actually hit the ball with power on the front foot, right? three or four sessions. And I've just been waiting for this moment. I've been waiting for it and waiting for it. And when it came, I was like all over it. Like, yes, that's it. That's what we want to see. Yes. So I become like this yes coach, right? Um, I wait for the moments when the cricketer does that basic thing to the level of excellence almost. Like, so the, the way I think about this, maybe it's a better way of explaining this is when we develop a skill, it's like layers on an onion. Right? And so we give this big chunk of information initially, and that might be the first layer. And then once they can do that, we peel that layer off and there's the next layer and the next and the next and the next and the next. And so because skill to me and the way I coach is sort of layered in this way, I, I've gotten the understanding that if we make that first layer something like really simple, fairly easy to do, big chunk of information, give them a lot of freedom in it. It's not so, no, you have to get your elbow like this and your bat like this and your arm like this. No, give me like a rough idea. Then what that does is it brings a level of confidence to the cricketer because it's normally easy to do, easy to achieve. And so it's like, oh, I can do this thing. I, I can actually hit the ball. Wow. Now, once I have that confidence, then we can tweak that a little bit. So, okay, well, let's say, if, let's see what happens if you start standing still. Oh, wow, I hit it better. Okay, let's see if I can step and hit uh, different lines of ball. So it's going to be the same shot, just in different directions. Oh, wow, I can hit it on my legs. I can hit it wide. I can hit it straight. Oh, wow. Okay, let's see what happens if you push your head more forward. Oh, wow, I hit it on the ground more regularly, consistently, right? And so it's like giving them these little things to be successful at each little thing on its own. Okay, well, I'm successful at this thing. Okay, well, I'm successful at that thing. Okay, well. And so as we go, we're really building uh, confidence in the skill at every level of the skill as it develops, rather than providing the cricketer with this uh, idea of what the perfect skill is. And they are constantly getting the message about how they're inadequate towards that how they're not keeping their head still yet, how they're falling over, how they're not swinging straight, how they're hitting the ball too early. And so the feedback the cricketer is receiving is sort of more along the lines of I'm not a good enough yet versus flipping that on its head essentially and saying, right, there's a skill and we can break it down to it's like easiest and simplest parts and get the cricketer to be confident in that. And then once they have that first level of confidence, we can build in the next, build in the next, build in the next. And slowly, 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 by the time they can hit that cover drive. And this would normally be 
like if I start with a five-year-old cricketer, right? I would say by the time they're nine, they have a real good grasp. Four years of sort of chipping away, chipping away, chipping away slowly. By the time they're nine years old, they'll have a good grasp on that skill. Now I want to say that I'm not just going to do cover drives for four years, right? We're going to drive, we're going to cut, we're going to pull. We might do a little bit of forward defense and backward defense as an example. But for the purpose of this conversation, we're talking about one shot, right? Just to keep it in a, in, a, in one context. And so by the time they're nine, they should have a good grasp on it. By the time they're 11, we can start challenging that and start um, adding in spin and see if they can still do it. Adding in swing, see if they can still do it. Um, we can get into sort of check drives and full drives and uh, hitting gaps with that. And so there's so many more things that you can layer on and layer on and layer on. And then by the time they're 13, you could sort of do, okay, well, can you hit it? I actually encourage kids to hit the ball in the air from a young age, but to learn to control it from a young age. I'm not a big believer in it has to be on the ground initially. Um, you know, and so I'll, I'll touch on that in another, in another podcast. And so I think that, um, where by the time they're 13, we go hard, soft, in the air, on the ground. It's so by the time they're 15, like they've got this thing near mastery already, right? It's so in their body. It's so, and, and, and they're so confident in it. They don't have to go, oh, shucks, I think there's something wrong with my cover drive. It's because every sort of step of the process, they've been able to feel confident, feel confident, feel confident, feel confident, feel confident. And the higher up you go, really, it, it all just becomes about more being then more selective, right? Being more selective around what am I playing? What am I not playing? When a cricketer is nine, um, you know, there's, there's a lot less bad balls. So the, the nine-year-old can have a bit more freedom if they often if they're nine technically perfect they actually don't score a lot of runs right um and so i think our challenge as coaches is to make sure that we layer these little levels right for the cricketer to almost like have a little bit of success okay next level have a little bit of success next level have a little bit of success and the more we do that we create this uber confident cricketer down the line in their skill because they never have to feel like they're uh, being overstretched and they don't receive feedback of I'm inadequate at any point in time. They receive feedback of, okay, cool. You can do this. Like now let's try this. Right. So it's more of an exciting thing to engage with rather than, ah, oh, geez, you know, this is not great. Um, and so the last thing I maybe just want to, uh, chat about in this conversation is that if we do it like this, right, if we layer it one skill at a time, one skill, one skill, one skill, one skill, we're essentially doing something that I think is super important too, is that we make it about one thing at a time. And so the, the cricketer doesn't have to leave a session. I mean, I was watching a coach the other day and I think in say, two buckets of balls, let's say 15 to 20 minutes, the cricketer heard 15 different things that he had to focus on from head position to, um, from head position to hitting too early, from losing weight to making sure they move right on the leg side to pushing with their back leg to, I can't even remember all the details. And, and I often wonder how that feels. I remember as a cricketer how that felt. It's like every next ball, you have to focus on the thing that you did wrong, the previous ball to do that right. But in the process of doing that, you, you're you not doing five other things, right? And so that's so confusing, I think, to cricketers versus saying, okay, we're only going to focus on this one thing today, right? We're only going to do this one thing. And it doesn't really matter about the other things we'll learn how those other things affect this one thing. So let's say I'm saying, right, today we're going to focus on, uh, or the cricketer might even come and say, I really want to just focus on hitting the ball later today. Okay, but now let's say I lose my balance. How does that affect my ability to hit the ball later? Let's say I'm not moving towards the ball. How does that affect my ability? And so you can build all the other elements potentially into this one skill. 
but the focus is on one thing at a time. I'm getting better at this one thing. I'm getting better at this one thing. So tonight when I'm going home, it's not about all the things that I'm doing wrong. It's about the one thing I want to get better at. And so if I come back next week and I'm better at one thing, and I come back the next week and I'm better at one thing, and I come back the next week better at one thing, or I have a couple of practice sessions every week, and let's say every week I focus on a different one thing. So I'm going to work on it against my coach because my coach, my private coach is helping me to sort of hit the ball later, right? Now I go to my school practice and I'm just focusing on that one thing. I go to my next practice, I'm focusing on that one thing. By the time I come back to, to my coach next week, I'm better at that one thing. In all likelihood, you'll be better, right? Um, and so after six months, where's the cricketer at? They'll be better at a whole bunch of things versus a constant battle about the 15 things that I'm not doing right. None of them have a specific focus. I've got to try and fix them all. Like that's really difficult. And so I think when we talk about developing cricketers, it's about making them better over time. A lot of the stuff takes time. It takes way longer than people think. Um, I've, I've seen so many, so many, um, parents and cricketers approach it in this way where they go, okay, it's like preseason. Let's go to the coach for three sessions. We've got trials coming end of the month. We should be good. That's not how you develop a cricketer. Um, you, you definitely de develop a cricketer over time, right? And we develop a cricketer over time because it takes time to develop these skills in this way. Every single level, little level and layer of the onion, confidence, 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 feel good, feel good, feel good, feel good on every skill. It takes time. It takes investment. It takes effort and it takes energy. And, um, the best creators I know and the best creators I've worked with, they've gone for coaching and played different levels of cricket from the age of five, six, seven, all of them, especially batters. Bowlers tend to develop a little bit later, uh, but especially batters, they've all been at it for quite a long period of time and they've had exposure to multiple different things, challenges, etc., etc. And we'll get into all of those things as time goes. And so down the line, uh, unless you're, if you're a parent sort of listening to this, if you're a coach, maybe you're a cricketer, I want to encourage you to sort of think about where you're at and just what the next step is. Just the one next step, make that step, make the next one, make the next one, make the next one. And we just keep making the next step, the next step, the next step. I always say to cricketers when they come to me, I'm not interested at all, ever in how good you are next week. I, I really am not. It's not why I'm in this game. I'm not interested in how good you are in a month's time. Like it doesn't interest me at all. I'm interested in how good are you going to be in three years from now, in five years from now, seven years from now, 10 years from now, where are you going to be? That's what interests me. I'm not in this for the short haul, quick fix. Um, teach you a couple of tips and tricks and off you go. I'm yet to walk the journey, right? I'm yet to get stuck in with people and say, right, let's go. You know, um, some of these cricketers that I've worked with, it's, I've stopped coaching them. I don't like throw balls to them. Um, they're not all mental clients of mine, but I know when things go wrong or when it's a bit wobbly or I can look at them from a distance and go, something's up here and I'll pop a little message and I'll say, hey, what's going on? And they'll go, I'm struggling. I was like, okay, well, let's chat a little bit, right? Let's, let's figure some stuff out. And I think the only reason I can do that is because I've walked the journey with them. I know them like they know me. Um, we, we, I know them so well that I can watch them bat and move and watch them run up and bowl and go up. Oh, something's off here. And I'm sure anybody, who coaches people for an extended period of time would be similar, right? Because we build relationships with people. You get to see them in the eyes. You get to see them in their lows. You get to see them when they've got lots of energy, when they've got little energy. 
you get to see them move when they're not confident and you help them through that. And then you get to see them um, move when they are confident and then you will remember that. And so we can puzzle little pieces together. And so it really takes a long period of time, um, you know, to develop a cricketer. And I think the best way to do that is to have a clear understanding of all the different layers, what is needed at each age to be successful and to then get on with it, to get after it. You know, a nine-year-old batter doesn't have to um, have a great defense. They, they don't need that. Not the world's greatest defense. If they can hit the ball with power, uh, they will make a lot of runs. And if they've got a very basic defensive game, but they can hit the ball cleanly, they can hit it in the air. Because at nine, people can't catch. Kids can't catch hard cricket balls yet. Not, there might be some, but very few. So if you're a batter and you can be successful at nine, because that's the first layer, right? So if you go 9, 11, 13, 15, at each level, there would be certain skills that if you have them, you'd be successful. If you don't have them, well, then you might struggle. And so I think that we need to understand that. We need to understand that there's like layers to this, right? And you've got to be busy with the right things at each age. So if you're not busy with the right things at each age, then you might not be successful at that age. And I think a lot of the time we either try and coach people to be international cricketers at the age of nine, or we see this technical marvel at nine, and I've seen plenty of this, some technical marvel at the age of nine, and we think they're going to be the next freaking Sachin Tendulkar. There's such a long way to go. Or we see this 11-year-old, a couple of years ago, there was a kid who made 200 of 80 balls and newspaper articles was written that he is the next protea. It's way too early to determine any of that. It's just way too early. There's such a long way to go. Sure, he might be ahead in the race at under 11, but by the time he's 15, he's sort of dropped back because there's some kids that have come past, right? Um and so I don't think we must read too much in those things. I'm not saying making 200 or 80 balls at 11 is a bad thing either. Um, but it's about what do you do from there, right? What skills are you de- Are you then going to go and develop the skills that's needed by the time you get to 13? Are you then going to go and develop the skills that you need by the time you get to 15, et cetera, et cetera? And so a clear understanding of the layers, right? What's needed to be successful at each age um and then to work on those skills and to work on them just slightly ahead in slightly ahead of time so at under nine like let's say five six we're really just doing basic and fundamental stuff uh seven and eight we're starting to do the things to make them successful by the time they're nine so that the year when they turn nine they can have a good year then they're going to go under 10 and they might have a bit of a dip especially if they play in a club and they playing against kids that are maybe a year older than them. They might be a little taper off in performance, and that's okay because we're busy learning some of the things, right? End of nine, we might start learning some of the things that's going to make us successful at 11. And so we want to just preempt them a little bit ahead of time with some of the things that's going to be necessary at the next level instead of expecting a nine-year-old to play like an international cricketer. uh, That jump is a little bit too big. I've yet to see, there maybe have been some, but I've really yet to see some nine-year-old phenomenal legend of the game still be highly successful at the age of 19. It's, there's very, very few stories like that. And so it's more about developing the skill, right? That's what I'm all about, that developing the skill, developing the skill, developing the skill, develop, always developing the skill. And who knows when your lucky break comes and you have a, a, a miracle year and you are just phenomenal. Um, yeah, I'm hoping there's some value in listening to me sort of riff here on this idea of the sculptor, the onion, the layers. Um, I know I'm not necessarily going into a lot of detail of exactly what to do at each level and what to do at each age 
Um, that's maybe for another day. For today, just the simple ideas. Are you busy with one thing at a time? Or are we busy building confidence upon confidence? Feeling good about one thing, then we move on to the next thing. Um, yeah, have a great day. I'll, uh, I'll catch you in the next one.